And the new attitude to empire contained a strong element of racism and the denigration of other cultures and civilizations. School books now dismissed Oriental culture as ornamental rather than useful, they told their readers of monuments like the Taj Mahal that it might be supposed, quoting from one of these books, might be supposed they'd originally been erected to commemorate the virtues of some great benefactor of our species instead of being the whim of some prince who dawdled away his years in indolence or pleasure. And different races, and increasingly now in, in writings like such as school textbooks or books and uh, magazines and so on, celebrating the British Empire, were no longer depicted as equal in the sight of God, sharing a common humanity, if at an earlier stage of development than that of the Victorian Englishman. But instead, as Bernard Porter has noted, they now emphasised racial difference and the alleged racial inferiority of subject peoples. The Australian natives, as a geography textbook put it, at the end of the century, are an ugly, unprepossessing people with degrading and filthy habits. Or, like beasts of prey, the Malays are always on the watch to assuage their thirst for blood and plunder. Or the tribes of Nigeria are extremely savage, practising horrible forms of religion accompanied by human sacrifices. And in such circumstances, it was now being argued, rule by the British was morally justifiably or as well as politically necessary. British were, indeed, in the view of the imperialists of the 1880s and 90s, destined not only to rule inferior races, but also to lead the entire world into the future. In popular culture, magazines like Henty's Union Jack portrayed battles uh, in, uh, in which uh, the plucky British invariably overcame far larger numbers of racially inferior natives. As Joseph Chamberlain, one of the leading imperialist politicians of the time, declared in 1895, I believe in this race, he means the English, the greatest governing race the world has ever seen in this Anglo-Saxon race, so proud, tenacious, self-confident and determined, the race which neither climate nor change can degenerate, which will infallibly be the predominant force of future history and universal civilization. The word race that occurs so often in these quotes is in fact relatively new. Belief in racial hierarchies based on descent had become more widespread once it had become possible to lend it scientific legitimacy. And this is not least a product of the growing influence of Darwinism in the second half of the century. In the hands of Herbert Spencer, who coined the phrase the survival of the fittest, Darwinism became a harsh creed of competition. Phrases like the struggle for existence, the strongest prevail, began to become part of what was known as what's been termed social Darwinism, the application of Darwin's ideas or a version of them to human society. In the worldview of Darwin's son-in-law, Francis Galton, who already began to apply Darwinian principles to human society in the 1860s, genius was the product of heredity. And by breeding the clever with the clever, it will be possible to improve the intelligence of mankind. Prime example, of course, was Galton's own family and its various connections in which brilliance and uh, scientific ability occurred in successive generations with notable regularity. Galton, wavering between designating himself as <coughs> scientifically able or just generally brilliant, opted in the end for the latter. So he appears on this chart there as being, as being brilliant. Of course, like other eugenicists, he didn't pause to consider whether wealth, education, circumstances played a role as well. Conversely, Galton thought that the inferior were threatening the future of the race by producing substandard children. In the 1880s and 90s, with the extension of the franchise and the growing organisational self-assertion of labour, Fears of working class insubordination, as I've suggested already, grew. What Galton termed eugenics, 
the idea of uh, using heredity and breeding to improve the human race, uh, the idea of degeneracy or reverse evolution began to be discussed. It's the beginnings of the welfare state in the eyes of some eugenicists <coughs> made the conditions of life less challenging and less complex. Or the function in life uh, with modern mass production of ordinary people, uh, ordinary people's function in life became, became simpler as more industrial methods spread. Now, the reductio ad absurdum of this view, of course, could be found in H.G. Wells's 1895 novel, The Time Machine, where uh, this is a modern picture of an imagined time machine, Wells's book, the time traveller discovers in the distant future that the working classes have degenerated into the Morlocks, a race of subterranean cannibalistic savages, while the middle and upper classes, the Eloi, have lost almost all their sense of self-preservation and competition and have no capacity to organise or defend themselves against the nightly depredations of the Morlocks. <clears throat> and that's a kind of extreme extrapolation of this view of the divergence of the intelligent and the stupid or the upper class and the working class. Social Darwinism became, if possible, even more pessimistic in the hands of Galton's disciple, Carl Pierce, seen here uh, on, the, uh, on the left with the aged 87-year-old uh, Galton. Now, Pearson rejected the view that racial characteristics could be educated into or out of human beings. No degenerate or feeble stock, he wrote, will ever be converted into healthy and sound stock by the accumulated effects of education, good laws, and sanitary surroundings. Such means may render the individual members of a stock passable, if not strong, members of society, but the same uh, process will have to be gone through again and again with their offspring. And this is ever widening circles if the stock, owing to the conditions in which society has placed it, is able to increase its numbers. So the remedy for eugenicists like Pearson is to encourage the breeding of superior humans and discourage the increase of inferiors. And while this might be possible within British society, uh, the, he thought this, the same principles are less encouraging when applied to the world as a whole. And here, Pearson was influenced by the French racial theorist Arthur de Gobineau, whose ideas were first developed in his treatise on the inequality of the human races. Uh, this was published, actually, in the 1850s. Um, the Gobineau, a pro-German, whose enthusiasm for the aristocracy was so great, he awarded himself the title of Count, to stake his own claim to noble status, argued that interbreeding could only dilute the characteristics of superior races rather than improving those of inferior ones in his scheme of classification. Gobineau <coughs> didn't win many adherents in France for his claim that the French aristocracy was mostly German, or uh, borrowing, as he put it, borrowing from earlier theorists such as Friedrich Schlegel and, and Spenon Arian in origin, as Gobineau, who in fact uh, popularised this idea of the Aryan. Uh, except, um, this is in the 1850s and 60s, but after France's defeat by Germany in the war of 1870-71, a debate was now sparked in France by uh, the extent, about the extent to which the Germans' victory had proved them to be racially superior. <coughs> um, so his ideas began now to be taken a bit more seriously in the 1870s. Not surprisingly, of course, in view of these ideas, uh, Gobineau uh, was most popular of all in Germany itself, where a Gobineau society was founded in 1894. Taken to fresh extremes <coughs> by the composer Richard Wagner's son-in-law, the Englishman Houston Stuart Chamberlain, in his 1890 book, 99 book, Foundations of the 19th Century, and Chamberlain lived in, in, German, in Germany, spoke German, wrote German, uh, these views <coughs> became the vehicle of a racialized anti-Semitism in which the Jew was portrayed as the eternal enemy of the purebred Aryan and Jesus Christ, the founder of modern Christianity, was not a Jew but a German. Uh, <laughs> Gobineau's pessimistic uh, denunciation of racial mixing, which represented in his case an attempt to denounce the levelling consequences of social change in Europe, had major consequences when applied by Pearson and others to the wider world. 
scientific, or perhaps what you'd better say, pseudo-scientific racism arranged racial types on a, an evolutionary scale and implied that mixing them together would pull what were now increasingly in writings about race called the higher races down to the level of the lower ones. And here you see, going from the bottom to the top, the supposed uh, uh, Negro in the middle uh, being a kind of halfway between uh, a chimpanzee and the Apollo Belvedere. It's a very characteristic kind of classification of the late 19th, early 20th century. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's 1913 story, The Poison Belt, indeed had the lower races succumbing first of all to the effects of a gas cloud hitting the earth from space, while the British, of course, holding out, uh, held out to the last. And then the races woke up in reverse order when the cloud revealed as only temporary in its effects, uh, then uh, finally passed through. Contemplating the British Empire and its history, Pearson believed uh, uh, that, as he said, history shows me one way, <coughs> and one way only, in which a high state of civilization has been produced, namely the struggle of race with race and the survival of the physically and mentally better, uh, fitter race. If you want to know whether the lower races of man can evolve a higher type, I fear the only course is to leave them to fight it out amongst themselves. And even then, he continued, the struggle for existence between individual and individual, between tribe and tribe, may not be supported by that physical selection due to a particular climate on which probably so much of the Aryan's success, he said, depended. And in this pessimistic view, education improvement are futile <coughs> when applied to inferior races. 